Good evening. Um, I want to thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. It looks like we've got a couple more people trickling in. I'm just watching the head count here. Um, we're going to get started, though, but I'll, I'll kind of move slowly uh, for those people that are coming in. So for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Greg McMahon or Dr. McMahon, and I'm based out of uh, two offices at Midlantic. Uh, chiefly, I'm really out of the Windward office. That's where I see patients and operate out of Lankana. Um, then I also do do some uh, procedures over the Bermal office on Thursday morning, where I, I probably have interacted with uh, uh, numerous uh, of you that are on. Um, my background, um, went to medical school originally, well, backing up originally from Massachusetts, but I uh, came down to the Mid-Atlantic region for medical school, um, and then did my residency in South Jersey, and then went back up to New England for a fellowship in urological oncology. And ultimately, uh, my wife's from this area, so we um, kind of wanted to settle back down in this area. And it's nice too, you know, uh, New England's nice, but it gets pretty cold in the winter. Uh, Mid-Atlantic, you still get all four seasons, uh, but the winter's a little bit more abbreviated. Plus, you got some good sports teams currently, so we'll also try to be done this so everyone can watch uh, the Phillies as well. Um, my specialties, I treat uh, mostly urological cancers. So when you're thinking about the urological system, that's going to be uh, starting with the adrenals, which is the top of the kidneys, the kidneys, the ureters, which is the tube that connects the kidneys to the bladder, and bladder cancer, prostate, which is what our uh, topic is tonight. And then you're talking about <clears throat> penile, urethral, uh, and testicle. So getting a little bit more into um, prostate cancer, the first thing that's important to understand is what is the prostate? So the, the prostate's located in front of the rectum and underneath the bladder, as I kind of previously mentioned. And it's really a, an organ for reproduction. Um, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse here. Hopefully you can. If not, um, I'm pointing towards something called the seminal vesicle. That seminal vesicle, that's where a majority of a man's um, ejaculate will come out of. And you can see it kind of has a tube that connects to the urethra. The prostate also will secrete some extra fluid into the semen. Um, and that you know, helps to uh, fertilize the egg and, and lead to reproduction. And you know, our race or uh, our, our uh, human's existence uh, you know, propagating. Um, <clears throat> kind of surrounded down in the pelvic region, the, the prostate is surrounded by a lot of nerves and, and blood supply to itself and other organs as well. And that's why whenever you're talking about treatment for prostate cancer, you're always wondering about you know, how will this impact a man's ability to obtain and maintain an erection. Um, and we'll get a little bit further uh, more into that as we go on in our talk. The size of the prostate, this is really hard to summarize. So as we get older as men, prostates typically enlarge. Now there's two issues that typically occur within the prostate. And the way to understand that is, you know, any patient of mine, you probably heard this one, so I apologize, but think of the prostate as an orange. We have the outer orange peel and then the meaty interior that you consume. Prostate cancer typically occurs in that outer orange peel, whereas the urinary symptoms attributed to BPH or benign prostatic enlargement occurs in that meaty interior. Uh, when we're talking about prostate cancer, um, you know, it, it can happen in men with large or small glands. And so size, it, it plays a role into a little bit of how we treat it from a surgical standpoint and certain things that we do when we're getting ready to complete the surgery. Um, but as far as a risk standpoint, you know, we do take in size when we're looking at your PSA. So if you have a really small prostate, Let's say that the average size for most men is about 45 grams. But say if a man had a 20 gram prostate and their PSA was five, that would actually be a high PSA density. Whereas if a man's PSA was five, but their prostate was 100 grams, you know, when you factor in or control for the volume or how big the prostate is, that PSA is actually a little bit lower or that PSA density is lower and not as worrisome. So that's how size kind of plays into a um, prostate cancer screening when we're interpreting the size of your prostate um, as well as the PSA value. Um, some very uh, uh, kind of statistics from a 30,000 foot view. 
Prostate cancer is the second most common uh, form of cancer among men, um, the first being skin cancer. And it's the second leading cause of cancer-related death in men. The average age of diagnosis, but your mid-60s, 67 is listed here. Um, but it can be diagnosed younger. I think the youngest man I have in my practice is in their mid-40s, but they, they really have a strong family history of prostate cancer where they have certain genetics that are positive and, and you can kind of actually see it kind of be tracked through their family lineage. Um, early detection, so if we catch the cancer when it's localized to the prostate, that is associated with um, better outcomes. Um, really what you're looking for there is overall survival or how long you live after you've been diagnosed. There's about 240,000 new cases a year of prostate cancer. Again, it's, it's the most common non-cutaneous uh, form of cancer diagnosed in men. And one in eight men, I, I usually say it's more one in seven is the stat I use, but still uh, pretty, pretty similar, will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. So this slide, and just to kind of take one step back, these slides were made for all of Mid-Atlantic and our, our bigger parent company, Solera. So there's, um, you know, I, I did play a part in creating them, but there's a little, some of it that I think, you know, we could, we need to tweak as we go through these a little bit more, so bear with us. But, you know, what is prostate cancer? The, probably the first question to ask is, what is cancer? And remember, there's multiple different types of cancer. You can get cancer from your head to your toe. And cancer is really just an abnormal cell growth pattern. And to kind of quickly summarize what you learn in medical school and undergraduate is that, you know, during the cell cycle, so think about your hair or, you know, um, your skin, it's, it's continuously growing and changing over. All your cells do that, though. And there's certain controls within each cell of your body, either things that accelerate growth or things that uh, kind of act as a break on the system. Now, if either the accelerator gets stuck down or the brake gets stuck up, meaning that you're not putting the brakes on, <clears throat> that can re lead to abnormal cell uh, proliferation or growth or division, aka cancer. Now, adenocarcinoma, um, when we're talking about adenocarcinoma, you're looking at glandular tissue. So you can have adenocarcinoma of the colon, you can have adenocarcinoma of anywhere that has glands, like the prostate. So when we're diagnosing a man with prostate cancer, typically, it is adenocarcinoma of the prostate. And that's something that you'll probably see on your pathology report. Um, there are some um, other types of cancer that can occur in the prostate, but they're, they're incredibly rare um, and, and not something that we see a whole lot of. If you see maybe a dozen of them over a course of my career, that, that would be a substantial amount. When we're using the term metastasis, the term metastasis means that uh, the cancer has spread from its original site to other sites. So typically in prostate cancer, uh, we're going to talk about having clinically localized disease, meaning that the disease is local uh, to the prostate and hasn't spread outside the prostate. You can have local regional disease, meaning that the disease is in the prostate and then the tissues immediately surrounding it. And we're really talking about lymph nodes when we're talking about that. And then you can have uh, metas uh, metastasis. And for someone to have metastasis for prostate cancer, it has to spread above the lymph nodes um, that are outside the true pelvis. Uh, so that could be what we call the retroperitoneum or the lymph nodes that are kind of surrounding the spine, the kidney, and other organs in the back, as well as the bone. Uh, the bone is a very common place for prostate cancer to go as well. And it's a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but as um, the disease becomes more aggressive or after multiple treatments, it can spread to uh, solid organs like the liver, and that kind of necessitates uh, that we change our, our uh, treatment plan a little bit. So what type of symptoms may you have with clinically localized prostate cancer? The answer to that is really going to be none. You know, um, remember that we are trying to identify men with clinically localized prostate cancer by doing screening. And how do we do a screening? Well, there's a lot of controversy in this area. If you kind of wind back the wheels of time about 10 years ago, uh, one of the government agencies said, you know, we shouldn't really be screening men at all for prostate cancer. 
the reason they came out with that is because we as a community as urologists were overdiagnosing and overtreating men. And that's something that we've really fully acknowledged and, and kind of gone back to the government on and say, listen, like we, we understand that we we're probably over screening, over treating men, but to not screen men at all is kind of an overreaction. And what we found over the past 10 to 15 years is that we were missing uh, men with clinically localized disease and finding them later in the disease pattern when they had developed that local regional or uh, metastasis which at that point, it's, it's you know, that magic word of, of cure is off the table. Um, thankfully, uh, with a lot of lobbying, the, the government agency kind of walked back their statement to saying that screening for certain age groups is appropriate. So there's a lot of different um, agencies out there that have different age ranges of which we should and shouldn't screen. The one that I uh, and most of my partners hold hold on to is about the age of 55 is the time to start screening for most men until about our mid 70s. Now, why would we start screening men earlier? We would start screening them earlier if they have a strong family history of prostate cancer, especially if they have a first degree relative um, that has died of prostate cancer or has metastatic, uh, has at some point developed metastatic prostate cancer. Who would we screen over the age of, say, 72? Well, really, once you get past that age range, we're going to be talking about, and this is always a difficult conversation to have with patients, but what is their life expectancy? And what I like to tell patients is, I, I don't know how long you're going to live. The only one that knows that is the big guy upstairs or big female upstairs, depending on your beliefs, and they do not uh, talk directly to me. Um, and... <sighs> Typically what we see in patients or uh, humans as we age is there's some defining event that occurs, break a hip, get some kind of cancer diagnosis, something happens that kind of sets the clock. And when men kind of reach the point where we think their 10 year survival is limited, that's really when we should no longer be screening for prostate cancer. Why? Even if you got it, it's probably not going to get you. So most forms of prostate cancer are very indolent, meaning slow growing. So if you developed it, it's going to take years and years and years before it spreads, metastasizes. And even once it metastasizes, it's going to take years for it to finally lead to someone's death. And so if you take, say, a 75-year-old that maybe has some other medical problems, you know, it is if they developed prostate cancer on their 75th birthday, you know, chances are they could live to 85, no problem. Most patients in, in the U.S. currently live to about 83. So you can see how you've kind of reached past that life to expectancy standpoint. Now, it's different. It, you know, some patients have really strong family genes, uh, you know, where people are living into their 90s or they're extremely fit. So that's why it's not a, a hard and fast, we're this old, we're going to stop. It's a conversation to have with your physician. A lot of the symptoms that are actually on this page <clears throat> These are uh, things that we always want to know about as your urologist. Um, they're kind of a little vague, but can kind of help us steer the pattern. It, these could be things for urinary symptoms. It could be things for kidney stones, um, things we worry about for maybe bladder cancer, but prostate cancer as a whole, when it's clinically localized, is asymptomatic. Risk factors. Um, we, we talked about age a little bit. So the average age is about in, in our mid-60s. Um, uh, family, strong family history, uh, you can see it occur earlier on. And so what are things that we would consider strong family history? Well, a first degree relative that had metastatic prostate cancer, died of prostate cancer, or maybe even if your mom had uh, a really bad case of breast cancer and had a gene positive called BRCA2, uh, that's something that we'd, we'd want to know because we'd probably start screening you earlier and maybe even consider getting genetic testing in you. Ethnicity. So if you look at um, old published data, um, African-American men uh, d uh, have uh, reports of having higher rates of prostate cancer and more aggressive prostate cancer at time of diagnosis. More, more recent years, this has been questioned. Uh, and, and really the question is, is this truly that African-American men have more aggressive forms of prostate cancer? or is it an access to healthcare issue where they're not getting screened appropriately and then we're, see, we're catching them 
uh, as they're having local regional or metastatic disease and not earlier on where they have localized disease. Um, that's something that it's a little bit of a hot topic in neurology now, so maybe I'll better answer that in you know, the upcoming months to years for you. Family history we went over again. Um, again, first degree relatives are something we definitely want to know. Obesity. Um, most cancers in general have increased rates of, uh, or they are, are found to increase rates uh, if, if we're obese. Now, again, questioning is, if you're obese, are you getting more tests done? So we're finding more things because you're utilizing healthcare more because of other health issues, or is there an actual way that that's manipulating uh, the cell turnover, you know, gas pedal break analogy that we used earlier? Not, not very clear uh, for prostate cancer. Screening tools for prostate cancer. Well, all the, all the men here are probably very familiar with this. There's two tests that we use commonly, and that's a digital rectal exam and also the blood test, the PSA uh, test. Just give me one second to clear my throat. So of these two, the more important one is the blood test, the PSA. So let's start there. Let's first talk about how was PSA uh, first utilized. PSA is a tumor marker meaning that when we have diagnosed someone with prostate cancer and they have been treated for prostate cancer, we use a tumor marker to uh, follow their disease to see how it is responding to treatment. When you talk about PSA as a tumor marker, it is one of the best tests ever developed. Now, we had this great idea years and years ago that let's move this tumor marker from when we know someone has prostate cancer and we're treating them, and let's move it over to screening them to see if we can predict who is going to develop prostate cancer. And therein lies the problem um, that this is a tumor marker study that we have tried to use to be a screening tool. What is the most useful way to use a PSA? Trend over time. So if you come in and see me when you're 60 years old and your PSA is four, does that mean you have prostate cancer? I have no clue. Um, there's a, a couple of tests we're going to do uh, to try to help hedge our bets. You know, we may get a prostate MRI, we may get a repeat PSA, we're definitely gonna do the digital rectal exam, and plus minus a biopsy. However, if I've been seeing you since the age of 50, and your PSAs have been 3.6, and eventually 3.7, and then 3.8, and then 4, 4.2, that trend over time is very, that slope is very low. But when we see men and, they, and we've been tracking them year over year after year, and then all of a sudden they have this quick uptick, that's worrisome. And that could be, you know, I have some men that their PSAs are 1.7, 1.6, 1.7, and then they come in and it's 2.5, 2.8, and we say, hey, like that's that's a doubling, or sorry, it's, a, it's an increase of one, like, What's going on here? And then we may consider a biopsy at that time. I have other men that are in my practice, their prostates are huge, like 120, 150 grams, and their PSAs are 13, and they're completely fine, and it's all benign tissue. You know, we've done biopsies, we've done the MRIs and everything to make sure we're not missing anything. They just have a big prostate. Um, <clears throat> a little bit more detail about the PSA. It's a protein that's, that's secreted by the prostate itself. And that means that it's specific to the prostate. And this really gets back to that tumor marker, meaning if the prostate's dead or removed, it should be zero. And so that's why we can use the test to monitor your disease response. The last bullet point, we kind of talked about this, was a high level. There's no normal. You are, you will establish your own normal by being screened yearly. Let's talk about digital rectal exam. Not everyone's favorite part. It's still something that we utilize. It is, it's hard to diagnose prostate cancer off of a digital rectal exam. If someone has, prostate normally should kind of feel kind of soft. So if everyone takes their hand and holds it up and you touch right underneath your thumb, kind of right here, that's how a normal prostate should feel. Now, if you take your thumb and you reach it all the way across to your pinky, and you, you feel how it's a lot firmer, that would that firm feeling would be more worrisome to me. However, in men that have really aggressive prostate cancer, it feels hard, almost like the knuckle of your finger. 
And that's that's usually not a good sign. And those men usually have very aggressive disease. You know, they may have a local, regional, or metastatic disease at the onset. But most men are going to feel nice and soft. Now, just because it feels soft, we have to use the PSA because remember that is that is the more important tool, and it's, and it's something that we want to track over time, not just cross sectionally. Diagnosing prostate cancer. So the only way to diagnose prostate cancer is a biopsy. There's lots of tools that we use to try to obtain uh, a better understanding of where we need to biopsy, who do we need to biopsy, um, and so forth. But the only way to diagnose prostate cancer is via a biopsy. And this is typically done where there's a transrectal ultrasound put in or ultrasound that's put into the rectum. Uh, it's typically about the size of a poop or smaller. And then a needle that goes either through the, the through the ultrasound, punctures the rectal wall and into the prostate. Uh, or sometimes we'll actually do a transperineal, which means we put the needle, uh, with the ultrasound probes in, there, in the anus still, we put the needle through the skin that's in between the testicle and the anus, and you can get biopsies that way. Once we obtain the biopsy, that tissue is then sent out to the pathologist. They review it, and typically we get the results back in about seven to ten days is their, our typical turnaround. Now, <clears throat> there's the second bullet point here, something called the Gleason score. This is really complex for patients to understand. And uh, Gleason, the name of the doctor that invented the score, was from Hopkins. Um, he's since retired, I, I think, unfortunately, has, has moved uh, in the past. Uh, but there was another young guy, John Epstein, that went down to Hopkins and really took over his work. And he kind of came up with this idea of, you know, we use this Gleason score to talk to patients about the risk of their prostate cancer. But the way that the score is made is, is crazy. Like the lowest you can get is six. Well, why shouldn't the lowest be one? And so what we have done as a community, and you will see this kind of take over in the next couple of years, especially as doctors get younger and younger and younger, because we're we've been the ones that have taught it, is to move away from the Gleason score to the Gleason grade grouping. And again, this is all just a play on numbers, but it's meant to make it easier to have a discussion with patients. So a Gleason score of six is now a grade group of one, uh, and, and, and it moves on. So the lowest grade group you can have is a one, and the highest grade group you can have is a five. The higher you are, the more aggressive the disease is and the higher risk category uh, you will be placed in. We're gonna talk about risk category in a second, so I'm just gonna kind of leave that to a side. Other things that we wanna look at are gonna be uh, when we're trying to take your biopsy results in a man that has prostate cancer. So biopsy results could come back and they could be negative. Best case scenario, hope, hope we all get that, but men that don't is we have to risk categorize you and that risk category uh, how we risk categorize you is going to help us determine what treatments are available to you there are six uh, risk groups for prostate cancer and so we look at your grade group remember that's the how the uh, uh, prostate biopsies look underneath the prostate your psa score how many biopsies were positive for certain grade groups if you got an MRI, does there appear to be cancer outside of the prostate? We call that extracapsular extension. Um, and also how much, so if each core is say, I'm gonna make this up 10 millimeters long, what percentage of that core is actually involved with cancer? There's some other tools that, um, and men that unfortunately that are diagnosed with prostate cancer that you may undergo. So remember how we talked about those risk groups. There's six of them. There's something called very low risk, and then there's low risk. Typically for those patients, we will consider active surveillance where we know that the disease is very indolent or it grows slowly, and it is not a type of prostate cancer that kills men. So we watch it. Why do we watch it? One, we want to make sure what we told you was accurate. So we're typically repeating a biopsy in a year. And two, we want to make sure that that type of cancer does not progress to something 
that could be more dangerous. So that's very low and low risk. Then you can have favorable intermediate and then unfavorable intermediate. These are typically men that when we offer them treatment, we are trying to intervene in a way to get them a cure. Lastly, you can have high and very high risk. Now remember, these are the, the more aggressive types of therapy. And typically, what I like to tell my men is that, that have very high or high risk prostate cancer is we need to think of this as a chronic disease, something like high blood pressure or diabetes. More than likely, one treatment modality, surgery, radiation, is not going to be enough over the course of a lifetime. More than likely, the disease will come back and we will need other modalities of treatment to prolong your life. Now, in men that have unfavorable, intermediate, high risk, or very high risk, we have to get certain staging studies on them. Staging studies allow us to understand, are, do you have localized disease? Has this disease potentially spread outside the prostate to the surrounding lymph nodes? We call that local regional. Or has it potentially spread outside of that region and metastasize? Conventional imaging, which is what most men will get, includes a CT and a bone scan. The CT scan is going to look at some of the bones in your abdomen and pelvis, but it's really looking for enlarged lymph nodes, especially in the pelvis. The bone scan is a study specific to the bones, where, where we're going to try to see if we see cancer in the bones. At Wynwood, we can we try to get both these studies done at the same time or on the same day, uh, just to kind of condense things and make it easier from your experience. That can't always happen, but that's you know Patty and Carol are usually pretty good at trying to line those things up. In my practice, I, I've really moved away from getting CT scans. I, I know Dr. On, Dr. Hag, um, uh, a lot of times we'll still get that conventional imaging, but we're trying to move away from that to really getting MRIs. And the reason for that is, you know, the CT scan again is going to help us with enlarged lymph nodes. Well, an MRI is actually better at looking at soft tissues, lymph nodes, uh, to see if they are potentially harboring uh, worrisome disease. Also, if we're considering surgical intervention, uh, I, I really want to look at an MRI because it really helps me with surgical planning prior to the operating room. Because they're, you know, not every case is exactly the same. We have to tweak it a little bit uh, to kind of tailor make it for each patient. And most surgeons, myself included, we want to know everything we can potentially know prior to entering the operating room. We don't like surprises. We like plain old vanilla every single day. The last test listed here, or the PSMA scan, this is really, uh, in, in my opinion, this is going to change how we treat prostate cancer um, in, in a very positive way. So the PMSA scan is a PET scan that is specific for prostate cancer. So how a PET scan works is you have some kind of ligand or something that attaches to something in the body. This ligand only attaches to tissues that have PSA. So it's specific to prostate cancer. That ligand then has a molecule that glows on it. So when you go through the CT scan, wherever this molecule attaches, glows bright. And it is more specific for finding metastatic disease than a CT bone scan or an MRI. So it is one, it is allowing us to more properly risk stratify men or stage them. Do you have clinically localized, local, regional, or metastatic disease? And then provide them appropriate therapies. But two, what we're going to talk about in a couple slides from now, that scan is actually being linked to therapy. So remember, the first part of that, that scan is that you have that ligand that binds to prostate cells. Well, instead of attaching a marker that glows to it, what if we can attach therapy to it. So we can give you therapy at a cellular level. And that's called Plevicto. And that's something that um, came on the market. It just completed clinical trials uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago. Um, and it's something that Midlantic now uh, offers. So that's great. We can uh, really provide um, cutting edge medicine in the community, which is wonderful. The stage assessment, you know, when, when 
again, you know, these, these are slides that we use throughout all Mid-Atlantic. Uh, I think we've kind of been through this a lot where we're talking about clinically localized, local, regional, or metastatic disease. Um, strictly speaking, we, whenever we're staging someone, we're always doing it, what's called a TNM. T stands for the tumor, um, N is nodal involvement, and M is metastasis. This is really language that we use to communicate from provider to provider. So, you know, uh, specifically like in my bladder cancer patients, uh, it's, it's really important to know, are we gonna give them chemotherapy prior to surgery, after surgery, and for me and the medical oncologist to talk back and forth. Um, for prostate cancer, it is used, but we, we really talk about it in, in very different ways as well. Um, more, especially when we're getting to advanced cancer stages, um, whether it's hormone sensitive, castrate resistant, metastatic castrate resistant, non-metastatic castrate resistant, which is, it's beyond the scope of this, this talk, um, a better talk for ones in the future. Um, but now you know, uh, TMF. All right, so what's best from a prostate cancer treatment overview? There, this is really, th there's a lot of data that looks into this. So I think the best way to start with this conversation is with someone that has clinically localized disease. Now, in someone that has clinically localized disease, the treatment options that are gonna be available to them are going to include potentially active surveillance if they have that low or very low risk prostate cancer um, maybe surgery and radiation, maybe even focal therapy. Um, we'll go through all of those in a little bit more detail. There's, there's one study, it's an old study, and uh, that looked at the difference between surgery and radiation. And, you know, at this point, uh, this study's going to be like 15 to 20 years old at this point. And it found that in younger men, uh, specifically under the age of 65, they live longer if they got surgery up front. Now, I would tell you the counter argument to make to that is that study was done 15 years ago. The way that we do surgery has changed 10 times over, and the radiation machines have gotten much, much better. So is that study still applicable in, in today's setting? I, I, I don't think so. Uh, but if your doctor talks to you about younger men getting surgery, that may be the study that they're referencing. Really, the way that I like to counsel men is that this is a very personal decision choice. And when you look at the most recent data, when you're talking about overall survival, and that's what matters the most, right? How long are we gonna live with a cancer diagnosis? And you look at the difference between radiation and surgery, people live about the same. There's no significant difference really what you have to understand is the risks associated with each form of treatment and in men that are going to need potential sequential treatment remember we talked about those men that have higher risk disease that how which therapy we do first may impact the therapy that we do second and then third and then fourth so that's something to, to also consider now, getting a little bit more into the weeds with active surveillance, again, that's typically something that we offer to men with very low or low risk disease, sometimes with favorable intermediate risk disease. This is where we're actively monitoring you. We're not intervening. Um, and we're looking to make sure, one, what we've told you is correct, and then two, um, to make sure your, your disease is not progressing. And our, our current uh, follow-up for that is you get a biopsy, let's say January 1st, to make the dates easy to understand, and you're enroll in active surveillance. Six months later, so in June, you're going to come back and see your provider, get a digital rectal exam, get a PSA prior, and make sure your PSA is relatively stable. If your PSA has jumped considerably, then we may say, hey, let's repeat a biopsy now. But if things look stable, then we really try to get a repeat biopsy at that one-year time frame. That's standard care. Surgical therapy. This is where we're going to remove the prostate and then reattach the bladder to the urethra so a man can urinate normally. About 90% of these surgeries that are completed in the United States today are done robotically. That is uh, really the, the preferred way to have it completed. Why? Um, it, it's better for you as a patient. Uh, better, better outcomes, shorter hospital stay, quicker time to recovery and better functional outcomes. So when we talk about functional outcomes, 
we're talking about erectile function and we're talking about um, urinary continence or being able to hold on to your water. Um, open surgery, uh, if you're gonna, or patients had their prostates removed in an open fashion, there's a couple ways to do that. You could do it through a lower midline incision, which is where there's an incision from the belly button down to the pubic bone, which is the bone that's right above your penis. Or you can do it via a perineal, which is the area between the scrotum and the anus. Uh, both ways are popular. Um, they both did the job, but again, they really have been replaced by robotic surgery. And the robot's really been popular for probably the past decade to 12 years. Side effects to be made aware of for uh, any type of surgical intervention on the prostate is urinary incontinence, and this is where you leak urine. Now, there, there's a couple ways to remove the prostate when you're talking about having robotic surgery. And all the new forms or the things that we're trying to move the needle on are trying to improve these functional outcomes without jeopardizing the cancer outcome, right? So remember, if we go in to do surgery, our first, our greatest thing is we wanna control the cancer while also balancing the, the urinary and erectile function. So we kind of always talk about it as a triangle where each point is important, but at the peak of that is the oncological outcome. We're getting the cancer out without leaving any behind. Um, and so one of the newer ways to perform this procedure is something called a RETSA sparing procedure. And RETSA is the name of a doctor that uh, you know, named a, a space that's in the body. But really, we're not manipulating a lot of the tissues. We're leaving a lot of the tissues in their natural place without disturbing them. And by doing that, what we've found is that the patient's time to recovering their, their ability to hold on to their urine has drastically improved. Whereas if we manipulate all those structures like dropping the bladder, it can take up to six to 12 months to really regain your urinary control. Uh, by doing it without manipulating all those things, sometimes when we take the catheter out seven to 10 days later, you're completely dry, but we really like to see it be dry by three months. So we've been able to move the needle up with that. Um, how surgery will impact your erectile function. That's, that's really a conversation to have with your surgeon and where they see, that's one of the reasons I really like to get the MRI so I can kind of tailor approach and also appropriately educate you about how much I think the surgery is gonna impact your erectile function. In kind of broad strokes, if you come to me and you have good erections going into surgery, you're probably gonna have decent erections coming out. You're probably gonna to have to, for you know, the first couple of months, use things like Viagra Cialis, do a little penile rehab. But I'd like to see you regain your erectile function. If you're already using agents like Viagra Cialis, you're probably gonna be dependent on them or need a higher dose after surgery. And if you have really poor erections going into surgery, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not gonna help that. You know, I'm, I'm not a magician, I'm not gonna turn that around. There's definitely things that we can do uh, to address that as well. Um, again, beyond the scope of tonight's talk, but something that uh, you know, we can definitely talk to you as well. Radiation. So uh, radiation is typically talked about as external beam radiation where we're this is a, remember, I'm not a radiation oncologist here, so this is very, very dumbed down. But we're going to be passing beams of energy from outside your body into your body. Those beams of energy are going to be aimed at one body part in particular and destroy that tissue and the cancer within it. So in terms of prostate cancer, we are going to direct those beams of energy at your prostate, your seminal vesicles, and the lymph nodes, perhaps, depending on your risk group, uh, and destroy those tissues and the cancer within it. Um, risk factors for radiation, um, kind of the opposite when we talk about it from a urinary standpoint. While you're getting radiation, you can almost have the feeling of needing to go too often or urgency, like a gotta go, gotta go type feeling. Thankfully, that typically goes away after you're completed the radiation, and it's all just from inflammation. Um, you can also get that feeling in the uh, bowels or the rectum. Unfortunately, if you get that, not all men do, but if you get that, that feeling does not go away after radiation most of the times. So to help prevent that, um, we actually, uh, in almost all patients at Atlantic, will get something called a space or, and that's a piece of jelly that we inject between the prostate and the rectum. It increases the space between the two. And how radiation works is that the further you are away from that beam, the less energy gets uh, deployed to that area. So even increasing something by a centimeter, centimeter and a half, drastically reduces the amount of energy that gets passed. So if we pass the beam of energy from front to back, hits your prostate, 
and that space door is behind the prostate by a centimeter, centimeter and a half, it's going to decrease how much radiation your rectum gets to avoid those symptoms. Erectile function will also be impacted by radiation, so it's not, you know, it's not something to avoid on that. Very similar to surgery. Um, some studies would suggest maybe a little less, but again, the best predictor of what erections will be like after any intervention is what they are like going into the intervention. Focal therapy. So for the most part, focal therapy is still experimental. Um, I, I do think that we're going to see it be used more in probably the next decade. Who's really probably an appropriate um, gentleman to have focal therapy, in my opinion? Again, this isn't really all uh, flushed out. Um, it's probably someone that has clinically localized disease and has either low risk or favorable intermediate risk. So why would we treat someone with low risk? Remember I told you most of those men we try to get on to active surveillance. If that patient was just too nervous to stay on active surveillance and they only had one section of their prostate uh, that looked um, worrisome, we could try to just treat that area. And someone with favorable intermediate risk disease, again, we typically treat those men very seldomly do we put them on active surveillance. Um, but again, if it was localized to only one part of the prostate, you could try to treat that just that part of the prostate. Uh, the, the current modes that are FDA approved um, are uh, ultrasound, which creates heat uh, and destroys the tissue, um, or by sticking needles through the perineum. Again, that's the space between the testicles and the anus and using either hot or cold to destroy the tissue. Hormone therapy. Um, so hormone therapy is typically used in men that have unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, high risk or very high risk prostate cancer when the disease is localized to the prostate. In men that have local regional or metastatic disease, hormonal therapy is the mainstay. Why? Well, hormonal therapy decreases the male sex hormone testosterone. Testosterone, a direct uh, um, um, protein that's secreted or uh, comes from the pathway is PSA. So if we decrease your testosterone, we're going to decrease the amount of PSA that your prostate or prostate cancer produces and therefore kind of put the brakes on the disease process. The hormone therapy comes in multiple different forms. The most common form is an injection form, and it's given in what's called a depot. Depot means that it will last for a certain amount of time. It either comes in one, three, six, and I think some of them come in nine months. Uh, three months is the, usually the most common depot because we're typically seeing you every three months. Some, some people that are, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, snowbirds, um, whether they go to Florida or Arizona, sometimes they want the six-month depot. Um, you can also get it in pill form. There's a new uh, medicine called Orgovex uh, that we that we have via our pharmacy that we can get you. Um, it avoids the, the injections, but you do have to take it every day. And then there's also advanced pharmaceuticals, which are kind of like think of them as the hormonal therapy, but on you know steroids or the the supercharged ones. And those are really only for patients that have really uh, aggressive disease. And all they do is they really further decrease the testosterone levels even further, therefore putting more breaks onto the cancer pathway. Side effects of hormonal therapy, well, these will definitely be felt. Um, it's best summarized as almost going through like a male menopause. So you can get hot flashes. Uh, you're gonna have some weight gain, uh, loss of muscle mass. You can get some nipple tenderness. You can even get some gynecomastia or enlargement of the breast tissue. Um, that will get better uh, uh, with some time. There's definitely other therapies that we can give you to help mitigate those side effects. Um, some men will also complain of lethargy or tiredness. Um, and another thing to also be aware of is um, it, it can decrease your bone mineral mineralization. So another thing that, you know, if you're on any of these agents is to make sure you're taking the calcium and the vitamin D supplement. All right. Um, 
some other forms of therapy. Now, we don't use a lot of these when we're talking about clinically localized prostate cancer. But immunotherapy is going to be, it, it's a play on recruiting your body's own immune system to help fight cancer. Remember at the beginning of the talk, we talked about how cancer is about how cells are rapidly dividing by either having the gas pedal stuck down or the brake pedal stuck up. The immunotherapy works to try to help reestablish an equilibrium. There were some early trials of immunotherapy with prostate cancer that weren't too uh, promising. Um, there's other cancer types, lung cancer, bladder cancer, uh, melanoma, that respond really well to immunotherapy. Um, and it's really, you're looking at the mutational burden, the higher mutational burden, the, the greater response you'll have. Prostate cancer, unfortunately, just thus far hasn't been the best responder. Targeted uh, therapy drugs. Um, I'm not really sure what they want us to talk about on that, but you know, it's really going to be your hormonal therapy, those advanced um, uh, uh, drugs for men that have advanced cancer, uh, prostate cancer. It's going to be things like abiraterone, Extandi, Erlita, um, and, and a couple of others, uh, uh, Nubeca, that are available as well. Again, all those do is lower the testosterone even further. Chemotherapy, uh, the current forms of chemotherapy that we use in prostate cancer is really docetaxel. There's also carbazotaxel, but most people get docetaxel. And that's typically given further along in the disease process where uh, you have metastatic disease that is no longer responding to uh, uh, androgen deprivation. There was a new um, data that came out probably about four or five months ago at this point, they looked at men diagnosed with newly metastatic disease, meaning they came into the office. And as when they came into the office, we found that they had metastatic prostate cancer. And if we give them hormonal therapy, so like the shots, and we give them a super hormonal agent, either Abiraterone or Nubeca, plus chemotherapy, they actually do better up front. So that's something that we're also shifting our pattern to as well. If, unfortunately, you are one of those patients um, or your family member is, uh, it's something that we partner with our medical oncologists with. Uh, we, we do not give the chemotherapy. We give the, uh, the androgen deprivation therapy and kind of that super ADT and then allow a partner with the medical oncologist for the chemotherapy. Radium-223, this is an injectable agent um, that can be delivered to treat men with uh, metastatic disease that's mostly in the bone. You can have some uh, adenopathy, but mostly bone disease. And it's been shown to one, uh, help with pain, but then two, also improve how long you live. And then this last one, uh, Lutetium, LU-177, otherwise known as Plavicto. This is really that, that exciting drug I was talking about earlier that's linked to that ligand and you know, the PMSA scan where it glows, but we remove that glowing portion and then we attach this, this targeted therapy where it's delivered to uh, every cell in the body that, that takes up that ligand. So it's kind of localized therapy all over the body. And this is only my opinion, but I think we're gonna see this be used more and more and more and even earlier in the disease state. Currently, you can only get that therapy after you have received chemotherapy. But I think in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna be seeing it used much, much earlier. Supportive care. So I, I think this is probably one of the most important slides in this whole deck. Um, you know, whenever I am talking to a man about an elevated PSA and we're talking about needing a biopsy, I, I'm always excited when I see them back to review the biopsy results and they have a family or friend. Um, it is just, it's so much information. It's so overwhelming. You know, your life can be potentially turned upside down. You, you need two sets of ears, two sets of eyes to really take this all in. And not only that is, you know, you're spending, you know, if I see you to talk about your PSA, do the biopsy and then go over the results, I'm maybe spending an hour total with you to try to give you all this information. But this, whoever your supportive care person is, is spending you know, your life with you, sharing it with you. And so for them to understand 
the, the diagnosis, the treatment decisions, the potential complications or the side effects, I think is, is monumentally important. Um, and, and I think most of my partners and all the, the docs at Atlantic um, share in that, that sediment as well. So please don't ever be afraid to uh, bring them. I have some in that come in because they just want to be just me and them when we go over the biopsy. But then I just bring them back a week later and I sit down with their family and friends as well. We're, we're happy to do whatever we need to. Um, what about research? We, we touched on a bunch of this stuff earlier. So we talked about genetics. So there are some genes that we know that one can increase the, the risk of developing prostate cancer, not only developing it, but getting an aggressive form of prostate cancer. Also, there are some forms of therapy, um, uh, uh, specifically what we call PARP inhibitors, um, which technically you could maybe put into the immunotherapy bucket that uh, are available to patients that do have a BRCA2 mutation. Um, now, that's not going to be a, a lot of patients, but there are them, uh, there are those patients out there. And that's how genetics is being used to kind of tailor um, one screening and then two um, treatment related decisions. Um, so I'll look at my notes to make sure I'm not missing anything about the precision. I think what they're trying to get at is here. So, you know, while we talk about prostate cancer as the whole, as, you know, men in general, really when it comes down to uh, your treatment, it's going to be individualized. And there's a lot of things that go into that. All right. Now let me see if I can work the questions part here. Give me a second. So well, I think one patient asked if, if I was telling them um, because they're older, is, uh, do they only have nine more years to live? No, not, not at all. Um, and that's why it's important for you to have a conversation with your individual provider to understand when should we stop screening? Um, you know, it's impossible for me to know all of your exact uh, other health issues and, you know, um, or your good health, bad health, and but it's that's when we, from a guideline perspective, the American Urological Association, uh, American Society of, of Clinical Oncology, are are kind of told, hey, you should start having a conversation about PSA ces uh, cessation or stopping PSA screening. Um, the retro, it's called retsis sparing, so it's R E T I Z U S. Retsus sparing, R E T I Z U S, retsus sparing prostatectomy. Um, and that's something that uh, I, I do based out of Lankana, Ilya, Ilya Zelter does at Bryn Mawr. A couple of other guys do it up and down the East Coast, um, but it really helps a quicker time to recovery from, from a urinary standpoint without um, impacting your uh, uh, oncological outcomes. Oh, so this is a really good question. So what can cause a 25% jump in PSA blood screen results over a short period of time? I didn't go over this. I'm really happy to answer this. So remember, PSA as a screening test is, is not great. It's not how PSA was invented. It was more as the tumor marker. So an acute rise in PSA can be from anything that causes inflammation. So say if you have um, an infection, UTI, if you have prostatitis, um, if uh, you had intercourse the night before, um, there's some like theories. If you, you know you go out on a bike ride, that could cause it. I don't. Maybe you're biking like in the Tour de France. Um, but anything that uh, can cause acute inflammation in that region will cause more PSA to be excreted. So, to kind of put this into clinical context. Say if I saw a man that was on uh, um, active surveillance or even an annual visit for PSA screening. And if PSAs had always been steady, 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 and then there was this acute rise, I'd ask them, hey, did you have any weird urinary symptoms when you get the test done? You know, did you go away with your spouse and, you know, maybe have more intercourse than you normally did? Um, and if anything raises a suspicion that that test may not be valid, then we just 
quickly hit the pause button. I have you go get a repeat PSA. If it comes back down, that's good. But if it's up that high again or higher, that's going to only raise my concern. And in really general concepts, if you know you're in a man, your PSA should go up slowly. If it's going up fast, it stays up. That's going to be something that we're really going to worry about. But a normal man, you're not going to see these really abrupt rises that stay up and stay going up, up, and up. PSA, prostate-specific antigen. PSA is prostate-specific antigen. And that just means that it is a protein that you can find in the blood that is specific to the prostate. That, uh, that's why like, if we remove your prostate, your PSA should be zero. So diet. Um, so in terms of decreasing your prostate cancer risk, there has not been any diet proven to decrease that risk from a randomized clinical controlled trial. So I cannot me medically tell you eating more of this, eating less of this is going to lower your risk of prostate cancer. But I think you can say that if you're eating a, a well-balanced uh, a diet, also maintaining some form of physical exercise and are in overall good health, that, that's only going to help you uh, uh, from a, a global health standpoint. And kind of as an aside, like, you know, we're talking about prostate cancer tonight. And obviously, you know, uh, of the people here, this is probably touching either you personally or a family member. Um, but the most common reason that men and women die in the United States is cardiovascular disease, not, not cancer. It's cardiovascular disease. So a healthy diet is only going to help reduce that leading risk of death. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes to see if any other questions come in. Um, but before then, I just want to thank everyone for logging in. Um, and, you know, if there's any other topics you want to hear about from a cancer perspective, you know, most, most of what I do in the Winwood office is with regards to cancer. Um, you know, please let us know. I'd, I'd be happy to do this again. Uh, we can also go into more in more detail about, you know, we, we really went over prostate cancer at a 30,000 foot view today, but we could go over it in much more detail in a, a specific subsection if you want. Talk about bladder cancer, kidney cancer, um, whatever, whatever you guys would like. Uh, last question uh, coming in. Oh, actually, there's a couple here. So cells that naturally kill cancer cells, you're talking, um, so this is when we're getting into immunotherapy, how we um, combat things. Uh, sorry, there's a bunch of questions coming in, I'm getting distracted. So immunotherapy really plays on using your natural immunity to, to fight cancer. So you're looking at things called your T cells, your dendritic cells, or your NK cells. And those are all forms of white blood cells um, that naturally fight uh, uh, off cancers or diseases, sickness, viruses. The problem is, is that cancer, as it evolves, finds ways to evade those cells. It's crazy stuff, but like, you know, when you think about it in simplistic terms, like this cancer is a living thing. It's not you. It's something different. It's it's trying to find a way for it to survive as well. So it's it's always changing and adapting as well. And so some of the most common forms of immunotherapy actually work uh, to to fight against common ways that cancer cells um, evade the immune system, thereby allowing those dendritic cells, NK cells, um, T cells to, to then locate and kill the cancer. Is the PSA an initial gateway test for prostate? It's the, it's, it is the initial test along with the digital rectal exam for prostate cancer screening. Now, um, Remember the prostate, you can also have lower urinary tract symptoms, which is going to be more prostate enlargement. And that's, that is incredibly common in men. 
Uh, by the time that we all reach 80, it's like ubiquitous. The way that we're urinating has changed substantially over time. But that is not a you know, the change in the way that you pee is not necessarily a hallmark of prostate cancer. They're, they're the same organ, two different disease processes. Would removing the testicles lower your PSA? Yes. So that's called surgical castration. So when we're talking about androgen deprivation therapy, or we're talking about the injections or pills or the kind of the super up uh, uh, pills, those are all forms of medical castration. Um, prior to any of these things existing, we, not me, I, I, I didn't practice back then, um, but they would uh, just castrate men um, and remove the testicles. Still something that you could get done today, by the way, if you wanted to, if you didn't want the injections or uh, the pills, it's a hard sell. though. All right. Well, um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I'm going to run upstairs so I can put my little one to bed. Um, but uh, for those of you I see in the office, I'll see you soon. Um, for those of you who see some of my other partners, uh, I'll see you around as well. Talk soon. Bye-bye.